best bouncy buttons in the series. Now I thought that Riddle School 5 was a pretty good ending for Riddle School. Maybe not the greatest ending, but still a pretty good one, and it kind of surprised me that people were still asking for a sixth game. And I didn't really know how that was supposed to work until sometime later when I had this idea for a way to continue, and that idea was, what if while Phil and Diz and everyone are returning to Earth, they get abducted? Not by aliens this time, but by Area 51, or at least an equivalent to Area 51. And that idea worked really well to me because there's the whole Area 51 idea of an alien crashing down in, in Roswell, and that alien ship being uh, taken in for research, or something along those lines. And so because Diz is a stereotypical alien and he's flying a spaceship towards Earth, like, of course that would happen. It only seemed obvious. So I tried to take this idea as far as I could, and it became this game. But this game was going to be the first part of a five-part series, and the other four parts that I had in mind didn't work out. Eventually I did make a Riddle Transfer 2, but it didn't follow any of the original plans that I had, or at least not most of them. But I'll probably go into that more whenever we actually get into Riddle Transfer 2, because that's where it's relevant. But yeah, I really liked the idea of an Area 51-based game even though it's called Zone 5.1, because I think Area 51 or Area 52 is a bit too... like, it's not original enough or subtle enough. And this effect, I kind of wish that this effect wasn't such a heavy, graphically intensive filter, because right here on this screen, as soon as the ship comes into the view, it gets so frame-droppy. But... whatever. Here's Zone 5.1. I just thought this would be a great opportunity to introduce a lot of interesting creatures that you could talk to, potentially. And I thought it would also be cool to bring the flying pig gag back with actually talking to the flying pig. Like this visual gag. This opening sequence took two weeks to make, which is also, interestingly enough, how long the second game took to make. Well the second game of the Riddle School series and the Riddle Transfer series. I think both of those took two weeks. And, uh... At this point, I feel like the Riddle School series was kind of becoming repetitive. Like, you always start in one room, um, and you learn how to escape that one room, and then the rest of the series is opened, or the rest of the game is opened up to you, more or less. But... I figured that this would be a good way to kind of ease people into this new story, is having it not be completely original. Um, so this game was kind of designed in mind with being kind of a mix between Riddle School 3 and 5, which are the two favorites, or were at the time. This poster has my friend's character, caricature, avatar, Karsh on it, who is also in the face-on book in Riddle School 3. And there's the monkey doll. There are lots of monkey dolls in this game. I remember at some point, this wasn't going to be a riddle transfer plan, but I had this idea to maybe have a plot twist where the monkey dolls were evil and alive, and it didn't make any sense, but I thought it was funny. There's television, um, which was not going to have any plot significance at first, but then it became plot significant in the second game. Oh yeah, and I kind of forgot... Well, if you click on this beforehand, before using the flusher on it, then Phil has this animation where he's trying to reach for the dial pad. I have no idea how he sees it, but just work with me here. There's no way for him to see it from that side of the room, is what I mean. There must be, like, maybe some... maybe... no? Well, it, he wouldn't be using that mirror... I don't know, it just it doesn't make sense. This game has plenty of things that just don't make sense. I like this gag here, the not empty box, where if you open it, it's an empty box. Um, these papers, you can click on them, and you have to click on them in order to proceed. And they don't have any indication that you can click on them, which I kind of feel bad about, because everything else has some kind of description over it whenever you roll the mouse over. 
um, but these don't. And it kind of it gets people stuck, understandably. So I wish that I could go back and fix that, but at least it's the only time that something like that happens. This is Goatman. Goatman, if you click here, it says uh, the hyphen makes it look like a Newgrounds username, but that would just be absurd. Goatman is, uh, well, he, he's Graham Nordell, I think is how you pronounce his real name, I don't really know, but he made the Return to Riddle School uh, fan game remake of the first game that released on the same day as Riddle Transfer 2, being the 10th year anniversary of Riddle School. And he also made this goat character, which starred in a couple of animations of his called, like, well, one of them was about the goat eating a mushroom, and the other one was Goat 51, which was about the goat just kind of happening upon Area 51. And whenever I discovered that existed after starting this game, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to use this character, and also because Goatman is the name of a cryptid, being a mythical creature. It didn't look anything like this, this is Goatman's character, but it just seemed like a really fun idea, and it just worked perfectly. And this blackboard, it's it has references to Goat 51, this No Way Out sign is a reference to Goat 51. It's an animation that I recommend checking out because I think it's funny. Uh, elevator key. I don't remember the most efficient way to get through this game anymore. I used to have it all figured out, but I think that generally the most effective way is to start from the bottom and work your way up. This is uh, the guard door. It's kind of a running theme in the Riddle School games to have one final obstacle before you can reach the uh, the final rooms. And in most of the games it's Chubb, in Riddle School 5 it's Oswald the monster. And in this one I wanted to try to come up with something more interesting than that, but I didn't know what to do. And then Psychosis91 said something that inspired the guard door. I don't remember what he said, but he's also the one who had the idea for the stake with legs whenever I needed an idea for how to make a stake look like it was alive in Riddle School 5. Here's Messy, the mock mess monster. It was fun trying to come up with interesting names for existing cryptids, but making them original. And I liked the idea of making it messy and having a really, really upset Loch Ness monster who has a funny hat. Well, it's not a particularly funny hat, but it's just funny that he's wearing it. Oh, this elevator, by the way, took forever to animate because it has to be anim it had to be animated going up and down, and for some reason, like the doors didn't align properly with the perspective, and I had to fix that, and it was a hassle, and I don't remember how long that took. I, I want to say that the elevator just by itself took about a week, which it doesn't seem like it would take that long, but it did. Hello, Fred. Fred's, uh, Fred's confinement chamber is based on the Riddle School 3 bathroom, and I think it uses the exact same urinal. I'm to use the power door for the card the doors. This screen also a reference to Riddle School 3 because this is the game that Mr. Potato was playing. And now, because I have my walkthrough next to me, I know that the answer to this is... Uh... There you go. That's how you solve that puzzle. And I wanted to use this flusher again for something, because I like when games have uh, multiple uses for an object for a puzzle. And it just seemed to work well for this. The only way to free Messi was by flushing him. It had to be done. Smiley face. Um, I like the sliding puzzle. It is really difficult if you don't know what you're doing. And I just happened to figure out a really fast way to do it at some point. But, uh... I thought whenever I was making some of these blocks the same, like this one and this one are the same, this, uh, uh, these two are the same, these two are the same, I thought that by doing that I was making it easier, but it turns out that I was making it harder that way, so... Um, if you figure out that this is the path that you have to use, then it becomes maybe slightly easier, but still difficult. 
Oh yeah, wait a minute. I need to talk to the negotiable snowman first. I love that name. I mean, maybe it's in bad taste for me to say that I like things that I make, but I really like that negotiable snowman name, and then his nickname is Yeti. Y-E-D-D-Y. -D -D -Y. <laughs> also love the learning to shave board game, because I don't know why that would exist, but... You've got an ice place here! <laughs> I figured since I'm sort of like Phil, and Phil, like me, would love puns, then all the other characters would have to hate puns. Because that's just how you get the best reactions. You have to talk to Yeti and use this line of dialogue right here in order to help him with his hair. Otherwise, you can't talk to Smiley and get her hairspray. That's who we're going to talk to next. Hello, Smiley. I felt like it was entirely necessary to give Smiley hair. And I also figured it would be a surprise for people who have gotten used to her design of not having hair. But I think it's a good change. And it took me a while to decide what it should look like. Like, it's here to indicate that she's a girl, because she didn't have many girly distinguishing features before, except for in middle school 5, I finally gave her kind of eyelashes. But what I settled on was giving her a ponytail, and technically this, like, it's brown hair, but it's a really dark shade of yellow. So, because she's a yellow character, it made, it made sense to me for her sudden grown hair to be a really dark shade of yellow. Um, and the code for her dial pad is 51333. It's not quite 1831, but it's a sort of smiley looking number to me at least. And then we get the hairspray. But the three is missing. Smiley Sunday. Um, her final, not final, her last name was not originally planned. Uh, I had to come up with that for this game because I thought that it didn't make really much sense for the characters to have their names above their doors without giving them last names. So I came up with the names of uh, Zach Kelvin, Smiley Sunday, and Fred Whistler, and that took forever to do. I think Smiley took the longest. Um, and maybe Fred took the second longest, unless I got those mixed up. But, like, Zack was the easiest, and it still took forever to come up with his name of being Kelvin. Also, uh, this background here, this wallpaper, it is a red sky, and uh, the last song in Riddle Transfer 2 in the climactic sequence at the end, um, is called Red Sky, which is sort of based on the main theme of Riddle School 3, which is which happens to be Blue Sky by Paragon X9. And I figured that by making the top floor of this building a red sky wallpaper, it was supposed to be foreshadowing, but that's the most obscure possible foreshadowing ever, so nobody was going to get it, but I wanted to use the theme anyways. Um, Zack tells you what the puzzle is to his door. I don't know why he overcomplicates things, he's just... He's kind of enjoying life in a really dry, sarcastic way now that he has a personality. I think that maybe whenever he started, his head started burning, instead of him being shivery all the time, he was finally able to focus on his personality, and now we know what it is. That's kind of my mentality behind it, but... Uh, his, his code is just 12345. and it was written on that side of the door. The reason that the characters know their door codes and you don't have to go to all the effort of doing something else in a different room or something to find the codes is I kind of felt at the time that I made this that it was silly when point-and-click adventure games had uh, puzzles to find a code when if you already know what the code is you can just put it in and then skip a whole bunch of puzzles. So I figured that there was less to skip if the way that you find the code is just in the same room as where you put the code. Also monkey dolls. Pile of monkey dolls. Uh, Alright, so I've got the hairspray. I should probably use this hairspray, although I'm gonna... Here's the chlorophyll returning. Um, I didn't know what the chlorophyll was supposed to be in Riddle School 3, but I decided that it was liquefied grass. And, uh... 
that seemed to fit perfectly well with Goatman. I like this effect too. This took a while to figure out, but yeah, I like the effect of just a curved line to represent the hose. And it was the only time in this series that I ever tried to set up an item that you have to press in two different locations to use. Now let's talk to Yeti again. Need to get the hat on the bottom floor, too. Hairspray. Now if you look really closely during this part, then you can see him throw by a... Okay, well, it just went... It went by really fast, but one of the objects that was thrown by was a statue of one of the characters in VVVVVV, the game by Terry Kavanaugh. And, uh... Just a fun reference, because I was playing that game a whole lot at the time. Hat. Now I think... yeah, I'm gonna use this here. Kind of this... like... I think, uh, this, this is pretty similar to the Riddle School 3 puzzle of getting the keyboard key and using that on the machine, but... I figured, uh, it was cool to have an actual 3 with a dice die. Dice block. Dice block is what they're called in Mario Party, so never mind. Um, right, going to talk to Goatman next. I tried to make these different floors, like, they all look pretty much the same, so it gets confusing as to where everything is. But I tried to have some indication on each floor of what is in it, just by the color, so bottom floor... Well, the bottom floor, I figured it would make sense for Messi to be on, because um, why else would you have a pool on any higher floors? And then this one's white, and it has Yeti on it, the snowy area. This is the middle floor, it's green, and so it has Big Toe in his foresty area, and it's also where the IFO deck is, because you wouldn't have a deck like this on any floor except for the first floor. Identified Flying Object Ship deck. <laughs> okay, so we get the daisy because this is the only daisy we can get without stepping on the grass, because he loves his grass. That is the whole goat character, is that he loves grass. Daisy we bring to Zack because he is allergic to daisies, and he bursts into flames. Some of these puzzles are really simple, but they're supposed to be along the lines of Riddle School 3, with its fairly simple puzzles. I knew that I didn't want Zack entering rooms like Yeti's room with all the snow or the ice, and uh, I wanted to restrict like certain things from happening, so I figured that a smoke detector was a reasonable way for him to not enter every room, because it would make alarms go off. We didn't talk to the flying pig, really, but one of the lines from the flying pig is uh, one that Phil says something like, Pig, you and I are going to be great friends afterwards. Um, the pig makes a reference to Phil in the first game, saying something like, I'm as free as a bird in a birdcage, which is the same line as the intro to Riddle School 1. And it's actually more applicable for the pig, because the pig is kind of like a bird, and it's in a cage where it was a second ago. And I had this weird backstory for the flying pig that returned from Riddle School 3 and 5, where it's it lives on this cloud that never moves, or actually, no, just the cloud next to it. I don't know. It was weird, but... Okay. Moving on. We make a fancy hat with the feathers, because a regular top hat isn't fancy enough for Big Toe over here. Uh, creature Communicator... I wanted to have at least one character that was uncharacteristically, like, posh. And this line here, Get Bent Monkey Dude. I didn't know what Get Bent meant at the time. Um, I only found out, like, way afterwards when someone mentioned that line was in the game, and they said, Wow, why did you put that in? And I was like, Oh, what does it mean? And then I looked it up, and it's more explicit than I thought it was. Um, 
It's not a terrible thing to say, I guess, but it's still not great. And... Yeah. I don't know. This cutscene is a uh, direct reference to Riddle School 3's um, interaction with Mr. Reed whenever he gives you the bookmark. And I think I had a line in here somewhere. I don't know if it's still in the game, but I had him mention, like Big Toe, I had him mention something about he's using a calculator, but he'll give you the calculator for a fancy hat. But I don't know if that's still in the game or not. He might just give you a dial pad for seemingly no reason, and... if Like, that's, that's kind of inconvenient, but oh well. Dial pad here, this is where Fred comes in. And then Fred has his snoz puzzle that no one likes, but I like a lot. Uh, 51702 is what this says, it's just run together. And I think this was based on a puzzle in Professor Layton Curious Village had something kind of like this, but I decided to make it my own in a in a more humorous fashion. So five one five one seven zero two is that it? Yeah. Okay, here's where he says it. Smiley and Zach are waiting for us on the bottom floor of this building. Except Zach, well, that line changes depending on if Smiley is there or not. But Zach is not on the bottom floor of the building. He's just right there next to you. I think that I had planned for Zack to leave and go to the bottom floor of the building after you're finished using him, but then I decided against that because it made more sense for him to follow you around, and then I just forgot that he continues to follow you around whenever I added those lines in. I did kind of make this game and its different puzzles out of order, so... There were just... Over the course of six months, there were some things that I forgot about, and forgot to test. Also, the perspective with these characters doesn't really make sense here. That's one thing that I kind of had trouble with with this game was um, sometimes the characters, if they're in one place and then they're moved closer to the screen, it didn't make sense. Like, they looked too big if they were realistically proportioned with the way that it was drawn. So, I don't know. It still looks weird, but... Here's the line Berserker, which is from Pico's school. There's a line in the intro in that game where a character says Berserker and then shoots everyone in the room. And because Riddle School was originally based on Pico's school, I figured it would be a nice uh it would be nice to at least reference it once. Here's a timing puzzle. And I was happy with this because timing puzzles seem to be so rare in point and click adventure games. And some people insist that it's impossible to keep the guard door open, but I'm pretty sure that's not true. I'm pretty sure that's always possible to open it. And, uh, game saves, like, 90% of the way through it or more. The reason for that is I didn't want to... Because the game is so non-linear for the most part, um, I didn't want it to be possible to save and then accidentally mess up the saving system, so I decided to just play it safe and make it save in the one place where I knew for sure what items the character would have, or the player would have. If that made any sense at all, I'm not sure if it did, but... Final room of the game. Um, and very obvious creature communicator shaped peg into creature communicator shaped hole. Music here is by Game Balance, who also made the music that is playing through most of the rest of the game, and it's a really good piece of music. And uh, he also had this track on Newgrounds called Laser Tears of Science, which is still there, and I was going to use that, I think, for Riddle Transfer 5, but then ended up not using it because there was just no place for it uh, in Riddle Transfer 2 whenever I eventually made that, but still good. I recommend listening to it if you have not, which you probably haven't. And all those puzzles are done. Now this whole thing with Diz and having his mind read, the general plot that I had in mind for this game was that uh, zone 51 or zone 5.1 was its own organization and they were 
They were taking Diz and learning about Vision so that they could use it to destroy Earth themselves, which made no sense. And uh, I, they also had this idea to take Diz and make him into Viz by like giving him red makeup, uh, turning his skin red, and giving him like fake third and fourth arms and giving him little fake stitches and stuff, and giving him glasses, like the Camino glasses or whatever those are called. And there was no reason to do that, but that was supposed to be the plot twist of the series, was that, like, Viz is alive, but no, he's not really alive. There's no way he could be alive. And it turns out it was Diz all along. And I figured that would be a really predictable twist if the series was going to take as long as I thought it would. Since this game took six months, I didn't want to spend six months for each game that I made. And I don't know. It just... The plans that I had didn't work out. Um, but I'll explain that more at another time. Now the twist of this game is that you get found out. Some alarm goes off somewhere. And then Diz runs off. This is supposed to paint him as a jerk, but not exactly. Like, he just escapes... Or the plan that I had was he escapes because he has longer legs and therefore is able to escape, whereas the kids have shorter legs and they're unable to get through the same way. So, Diz was just doing what he could, and then the kids have to find another way out. But then, I had plans for Diz to kind of redeem himself later, like he knew that he was a jerk here, and then he, just, uh, he saves Phil in the end, whenever Phil is in danger, something like that. And here's the cliffhanger that everyone was left with for five years. Now, if this game had a satisfying ending, and if it didn't say end of part one right here, I probably would have never made a sequel, because I was basically done with this series after I spent a year mulling over what the second game might be like and then not succeeding with it and then trying to move on to other things. But the fact that this game had a cliffhanger kind of weighed on my mind all those years, and so... Finally closing off the cliffhanger was a good feeling. One thing that I wanted to point out is that the font for the title of Riddle School is different from the font of the title in Riddle Transfer, because the Riddle School games all used Copperplate Gothic Bold, and I it's a, it's a serif font, and I tried to remove the serifs and make it a sans serif font for Riddle Transfer to make it more modern, because it's a new thing, and... Then later I discovered that there is a font that's just like what I was looking for called Media Gothic, which that font doesn't have numbers for some reason, but it was still very helpful to know that that font existed. And I think that's mostly it, so I'll see you in the next and final game, which has a history behind it to be sure. Oh boy.